Uh, in fact, I think they were the only scholars who could have persuaded me to study Indian politics when I was doing graduate work. Uh, I actually did think that the field of South Asian studies was excessively politicized in all kinds of wrong ways, and the Rudolphs kind of stood apart from that as models of scholars that you would actually want to be. So I wasn't even in the field of South Asian studies. Uh, um, but the one sort of link we had, and whenever they'd drop into Cambridge, when you know they were invited for seminars, Cambridge, Massachusetts, when I started teaching at Harvard, was two old teachers of theirs when they were graduate students, I think, at Harvard. Um, I'm not sure whether they were teachers or contemporaries. Um, one was Sam Beer. Um, who used to teach this legendary course at Harvard in the 50s called the Social Science Sequence, SOCSI 1 and SOCSI 2. Um, and if you look at the kind of the composition of his classroom, there's the Rudolphs, Michael Walzer, you know, all the kind of greats of contemporary social theory emerged uh, out of this, uh, the classes. And the other was an Americanist, um, who then you know, was Arthur Maas. And one day, just by pure accident, and, and just to kind of segue into the, the talk, uh, I think Ashutosh Varshne had probably invited them for some seminar, and we were walking in Harvard Yard, and we ran into sort of Sam Beer and Arthur Maas, and you know, they're saying hello to each other, or whatever. And we start having a conversation about various things. Um, Sam Beer was this extraordinary intellectual historian, although he studied British and American politics, uh, you know, a contemporary of, um, sort of a student of Christopher Hill's, kind of very much made the kind of transition from, you know, the left, sort of, the social democratic left as a brutal center. And so they're ruminating about various things in the world. And at some point, Sam Beer turns to the Rudolphs, one of them, and says, so, when are you going to write that big book on social theory you promised? And I wasn't sure what the context of this was. I, I'm not even sure whether they promised. But the conversation was really about saying that although the Rudolphs had worked on India, uh, and most of their work was was in India, and there was some comparative work that uh, that Sudan in particular uh, published, particularly at, I think a presidential lecture to the Association of American Studies. Uh, there was a case to be made that out of their work, right, you could actually construct a larger and broader social theory of democracy. That this wasn't just kind of about India, as it were, that the India material was speaking to a larger conversation in social theory. Some in very obvious ways. I mean, for example, when the modernity of tradition was written, everybody immediately interpreted it as a kind of in dialogue with modernization theory you know, and, 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 and the way it complicated assumptions about modernization theory. But not just at that level of taking a body of theory and kind of critiquing it from an Indian perspective, saying how does the Indian experience kind of complicate it. But that if you looked at their body of work, you know, over a kind of long period, there is a kind of interesting theory of democracy waiting to be teased out from that work, although they were far too careful, uh, far too fastidious as scholars, uh, far too modest in some ways, I think, in their personal dispositions to make uh, any, any of those grander claims. Uh, I think there is a case to be made that there is a kind of running thread to their work, and, and somewhat speculatively, I'll sort of try and kind of tease that out and show why that illuminates our contemporary Mormon. And if I were to give this so I had a name, I'll call it provocatively kind of the Rudolphs is realist romanticism, right? And I'm emboldened by the title that um, um, they gave to, or, or yeah, under which the last book, which has just literally come out a few days ago, I think, um, on James Todd, The Last Romantic, right? Um, so, you know, it's a short book, a last kind of incomplete in some ways, but, but, but really quite a valuable resource. And I was reading that book three or four days ago, and it just struck me, you know, there it is. I mean, they, they, they talk about Todd as the last romantic. In that context, it's talking about Todd's romanticism as a kind of critique of James Mill's, you know, sort of universal bureaucratic utilitarianism in, in some ways. But what struck me about, I think, their account of Todd, and their almost kind of sympathetic 
reconstruction of thought, particularly in response to James Mill, is not the fact that, you know, Mill is imperializing in some ways and Todd is more sympathetic to the natives, as it were, I mean, that, you know, at, at that level of moral articulation. It's their interest in Todd's account of intermediate associational life in the states of Rajasthan, where Todd basically makes the argument, and this is Todd's arguments against British colonialism, that in a way what colonialism is doing is actually deepening despotism including in the states of Rajasthan, the kind of princely states of Rajasthan, because what colonialism has essentially done is it's kind of created this alliance of a kind of foreign power with the Maharaja in whatever princely state happens to be, and that alliance is essentially crushing out all intermediary sites of resistance to the Maharaja, right? I mean, that was in a sense Todd's kind of, you know, construction that when you, when, you know, in a sense, when you think of what makes Rajputana states fonts of liberty, and he's talking about liberty in the kind of 19th century sense, this very kind of Toquillian idea of aristocratic intermediate orders as the bearers of liberty, right? It is that they actually also provide, provide a bulwark against absolutism of a certain kind. I mean, Todd does, of course, no doubt that these societies are hierarchical. He doesn't regret the fact that these societies are hierarchical, that different classes are arrayed in relationships of power. It is a feudal society, right? But much like 19th century social, European social theorists, including those who worried about democracy, like Tocqueville and so forth, right? There was this kind of sense that, can you use these intermediate orders that constitute society as a kind of bulwark against absolutism? Right? And the minute I kind of read that account, said, you know, it's a consistent thread running through uh, the, 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 the Rudolph's work. It's stored against James Mill. It's the mobilization of a certain kind of identity politics around caste as a bulwark against absolutism. I mean, the idea of kind of caste mobilization as a democratizing force, right? And it's not just a democratizing force, you know, which is, which is the part that has actually often been written about, but I think in their understanding of Indian society, given that those were the locus of mobilization, independent sources of power within society, they could also actually act as a bulwark against kind of absolutism. And later when they fleetingly wrote about uh, Hindu nationalism, particularly in that New Republic essay, um, you know, at the height of the Ram Janbhumi movement uh, called Modern Hate, right? I think, again, very tantalized by the thought that Hindu nationalism represented a new kind of absolutism. And they were, you know, very particular about emphasizing that it is actually a modern phenomenon. This is not an ancient primordial hatred. It is discursively constructed. Um, uh, in fact, if you read their account of the discursive construction of Hindu nationalism in that essay, it's tempting to try and imagine what they would have made of the construction of nationalism through social media. You know, television was that big rupture in the early 90s, um, used as a medium to kind of forge a new pan-Indian Hindu identity through uh, a, a different kind of discursive and symbolic uh, articulation, particularly around the serials of you know, Ramayana in particular, as you know, I think sort of you know, Philip's also sort of written about, um, this very powerful recognition that these identities were in the process of being kind of, you know, transfigured, reconstructed through a new kind of symbolic articulation. And I think underlying a worry, which is, you know, what would be the sources of resistance to this kind of homogenization and absolutism, right? So at one level, you might say, you know, the roles of the great theorists, right? of the idea that you need intermediate orders of society, right? It's not just enough to have constitutional guarantees. It's not just enough to have formal structures of power kind of providing the usual checks and balances that, you know, you need in constitutional democracies. You know, obviously they were, you know, all for that. But that there may be some value in thinking about a whole range of social orders that intrinsically in their own identity and articulation might not seem democratic. They don't correspond to your 
canonical virtues of democracy. They itself are reflections of a kind of hierarchical order. But taken together, they can actually act as a kind of bulwark against absolute stakeholders of society, right? And the reason I think it's, this, this argument is important at this particular juncture to think about um, is, is for two reasons. One is a kind of social theoretical reason that's, that was the conversation in a sense that we started having with Sam Beer, you know, thinking about the great sweep of European history, which is this was a very powerful argument in the 19th century. Right? And the powerful argument in the 19th century was that you are more likely to get centralized absolutist states right? if you manage to, in some senses, destroy the fabric of these intermediate orders of society. And the dilemma of liberal states from the 19th century onwards has been this kind of interesting twin dilemma, which is on the one hand, the discourse of individual rights, the discourse of equality, the requirements of individual liberation, right? the creation of the circumstances of freedom and individuality require disembedding individuals from the communities which they inhabit, right? Because those communities exercise oppression on them in their own right, right? Uh, you know, it's a very kind of familiar liberal dilemma, right? But as any 19th century social theorist would have also pointed out, the big danger is that if you actually disembed those individuals from this whole variety of intermediate social orders, caste, you know, community, aristocratic orders, you could actually prepare the groundwork for a much more effective absolutist state. Because the one thing the absolutist state absolutely doesn't like, right, is any locus of power other than the one that, in a sense, emulates from the sovereignty. And if you look at 19th century social theory, Tocqueville in particular, right, that was the dilemma about France, right? Why France is going through these absolutist spasms, right? Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the 18th premiere that you know, Marx and Tocqueville also wrote about. The, the central conundrum of French liberty or lack of French liberty compared to the English, right, was the fact that the one thing the revolutionary tradition did in the name of emancipating the uh, uh, individual, in the name of instituting inequality, it actually destroyed all those intermediate social orders that could have actually represented a bulwark against the absolute state. And obviously for French theorists, England was the contrast, right? I mean, that, again, pretty standard contrast where England, quote unquote, had a mixed constitution. And the idea about the mixed constitution, you know, the old Aristotelian Montesquieu idea, wasn't so much just that the formal constitution has a different balance of powers, checks and balances. It's mixed in precisely this sense, which is that there is no one principle, right, which becomes, as it were, the central legitimizing principle of all social relations, right? So you have a bit of liberty, you have a sort of bit of, uh, you know, you might say, let's say, kind of conservative social institutions as well. You have equality, but you also, you have mobility, rather social mobility, but you also have the maintenance of a certain kind of distinction in aristocratic ideal. Uh, you have deracinated, emancipated individuals uh, at the same time as you still have communities that can actually, in a sense, find space for their own individual identities. And I think this argument, you know, which was very important for the 19th century, and, 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 and as, I mean, I don't know whether they would have agreed with this formulation, but the more I think about almost all the corpus of Rudolph's work, the modernity of tradition, and I'll just talk about in pursuit of Lakshmi in a bit, uh, I think took that argument very, very seriously, right? Uh, which is that, you know, does liberty require alternative loci of power in sort of social relations? And these actually have to be constituted qua social relations. It can't be just abstract sort of, check, you know, checks and um, uh, balances. So in that sense, and, that, and that's what I meant by the realist romantics, which is I don't think their fascination with, you know, intermediate sources of mobilization like caste groups, for example, or towards aristocratic orders, uh, simply came from the kind of romantic uh, 
you know, fascination with Rajasthan or the, or the romantic fascination with caste or, or, you know. I think it fundamentally came from a very deeply dialectical understanding of how liberty actually comes to be in diverse and complex societies. Um, that what looks like a patently undemocratic, un unmodern in some senses, right, a scriptive set of social orders can collectively, right, if, if in a sense configured in an ameliorative way, actually produce the conditions of liberty. Now, the reason why I think this important argument is important at this con contemporary conjuncture, that's the, uh, is, if you look at democracies all over the world right now, right, uh, uh, I mean, Ronan Jai heard a bit of this argument yesterday. Uh, in India in particular, we are going through uh, a phase of democratic mobilization that you might say has four characteristics that the Rudolphs would not have been entirely surprised by. Uh, they would have certainly be disappointed by those four characteristics, uh, that that's the trajectory that Indian democracy has taken. Um, but it's worth asking what are the conditions that created these four characteristics, right? So one is ultranationalism, right? Ubiquitous feature of modern democracy, kind of new discursive articulation of nationalism. The second is authoritarian centralism, right? It's not that we haven't had episodes like that before. Indira Gandhi certainly kind of comes to comes to mind. But I do think this moment is different because I think I think when the Rudolphs wrote in pursuit of Lakshmi, they still had the sense that Indira Gandhi's was much more superfic superficial at one level. Uh, you know, it kind of it's a phenomenon that existed at the top while all of this intermediate structure of civil society and caste associations actually, you know kind of coexisted in the bottom, you know, uh, um, coexisted at the uh, at the bottom. So, you know, central authoritarianism, ultranationalism. The third is the reassertion of political sovereignty over the economy, right, uh, which is a kind of, you know, when we think of politics post-liberalization, uh, the main thread running through economic reform, the debate over economic reform, was how do we actually insulate economic decision making from politics, right? In fact, globally, that's actually been largely the, the structure of regulatory reform, all from the 1990s onwards, right? And you could say there's an economic theory behind it, there's good reasons to want to do that, right? And what you're seeing with a vengeance all over the world, right, from Trump to Modi, is essentially the political demand to say, we have to actively be seen to be reasserting political control over the economy. That in some ways, things like employment, inflation, whatever your economic objectives, they can't be seen to be a product, either of anonymous you know, economic forces, uh, uh, like globalization, uh, or institutions that do not derive their legitimacy from actually the sovereign will of the people embodied in this strong leader, right? And, and it's interesting, both Trump and Modi will constantly <coughs> remind you, right? I mean, the point about saying, you know, Toyota, move your jobs to Mexico, or don't move your jobs to Mexico, or, you know, giving threats to carrier is, whatever one may think of the economics of it, right? At one level, it's a very powerful symbolic articulation of the idea that you know, political sovereignty can somehow actually restructure these economic relationships in a, in a very fundamental way, right? Um, uh, so, so reassertion of political sovereignty over domains of economic life, you, you might say demonetization is one, one particular um, example of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of that as well. That this phenomenon, this, this conjuncture, right, of these, these different elements, ultranationalism, demo, you know, authoritarian centralism, um, and a strong reassertion of sovereignty, undergirded by a politics, right, which, which all three of them require, a, a kind of conspiratorial politics where you'll have to constantly find enemies to create a disturbed discursive articulation that can sustain the authority of both the ultranationalism and the centralism, right? This is a pretty radical and unique conjunction in Indian politics. And I think the question a lot of people are asking is, uh, you know, does this in some way negate or refute the, the enthusiasm Rudolphs had or the optimism they had about the kind of centralism, the centrism 
of Indian politics, right? Are we at a conjuncture where that centrism is being threatened? Mind you, Indira Gandhi had democratic centralism, but the centrism was not threatened because it, you know, it, it, as I say, it, it, it didn't have that communal nationalist articulation actually associated with it. That was one element. And it did not have this kind of radical reformist ambition, right, of taking all intermediate orders of society, including civil society, and recasting them in the image of the state. That was much more, much more a straightforward story of kind of, you know, sort of political suppression, right? rather than this kind of social re-articulation in a deep sense, right? And so the question is, what's changed between the 70s and 90s that makes this much more of a threat to Indian democracy than we thought? Um, the Rudolphs were always very sanguine about Indian democracy. In fact, you know, if you want an interesting uh, snippet of the debates over democracy, it's worth reading Rajni Kothari's review of In Pursuit of Lakshmi. You know, and, and Rajni in those days been snow words, and Rajni is basically saying, you greatly admire the Rudolphs, but he says, you know, where's the blood and guts, <laughs> right? Where's the, where's the deep violence that I see around uh, it? And it, it's not that it wasn't there in the book. I mean, you know, uh, Rudolphs are the, probably the most wide-eyed observers of Indian politics, right? But I think fundamentally, fundamentally, right, it was just much more optimistic, uh, despite the experience of the 70s about that trajectory of Indian democracy. Now, if my argument about these intermediate orders is correct, right, then one Rudolphian explanation of what we are seeing right now would go something like this. That the last 20 and 30 years have actually seen the erosion of almost all other orders of society that could actually have provided a resistance to this kind of let's call it absolute dis-centrism, right? Why? So the first source of resistance, which you had in the 70s and 80s, was politics constructed around class, right? Uh, one of the big theoretical innovations of In Pursuit of Lakshmi was to take on head-on this question about, you know, the relationship between class politics and caste politics, uh, you know, and, and you know, particularly if you read it in conjunction with modernity of tradition. And at that point, the Rudolphs had various explanations uh, about, in a sense, um, uh, the relative weakness of class politics in India. Part of it turned on the fact that India was, in classical political scientist terms, a premature democracy, which is if you have a largely agrarian society, you will not get the kind of class politics that you would have went through uh, because you have the dominance of agrarian demand groups which, as you know, are in class lines, in terms of class politics, as old Marxists would have said, um, are much harder to organize in terms of uh, a class having consciousness of itself as a political class. Right? Nevertheless, in that book, they made a very powerful argument about the fact that the rural sector, in particular, you know, peasants and farmers, were a very powerful demand group in Indian society. Right? In fact, the entire political economy of that book is structured around the political salience and political dominance of these agrarian demand groups. Right? And if you look at their works in the 70s, you know, and you look at social mobilization in the 70s, it was largely centered around three groups. There was agrarian groups. Right? You used to have peasant protests in Delhi almost every two weeks, right? I mean, you used to, you know, every farmer's leader would turn up with a truckload of farmers. You had the rise of the student movement, right? Which was the conduit of entry of a lot of this generation of politicians, right? Through the J alignment with the JP movement. And then even with the ABVP as a new form of student movement in the 70s, right? And I think one of the interesting questions to ask is, and, and ultimately it's that combination, the gradient demand groups, the, you know, the, the rise of the new peasantry in UP, um, um, uh, you know, which was mobilized. We think of it as class mobilization, caste mobilization, but it's also a form of class mobilization that actually fragmented power enough in the Indian system, right? That you got years and years of coalition governments, right? Um, now, you might interestingly ask, what happened to all those movements? We talk a lot about agrarian distress these days, from farmer suicides to you know everything else. But you've not seen 
farmers' politics of the kind that you actually did in the 1970s, 1980s. The labor movement, of course, of course, long been dead, which again, let's not forget, in the 70s was a powerful force, particularly in cities like Bombay, right? And the student movement has also been pretty moribund for a while. It's now kicking back into life in, in, in a couple of interesting ways, right? And I think, I mean, my own explanation, and, and, and you know, the Rawls worried that, you know, if, if, if you have the dissolution of these demand groups, right, what will be the bulwark against the centralization and absolutism, right? My own explanation for that, I think, as I said, their explanation largely hinged on the fact that India was, at least in economic development terms, a premature democracy. My own explanation for the fact is that actually, paradoxically, democratic decentralization has actually killed a lot of these class-based or demand-based groups, right? Uh, and this is also a very Rudolfian explanation in the sense that one of the arguments they make about what will make India centrist is that because the state is a locus of democratic mobilization, the way the state, in a sense, mobilizes, right, or, or, or the kinds of mobilization the state allows is through a form of sort of, let's say, patronage politics, divide and rule, right? Inherently divides people, not, not in communal lines, but, but in terms of interest groups you pick. My own hunch is that one of the least studied aspects of decentralization is that once the 73rd Amendment was instituted and you actually get panchayat politics at the village level, does that in some way politically fissure the class identity of agrarian demand groups? Right? Uh, it's just a hypothesis, right? I'm just kind of sort of putting it out there that the very mechanism that they thought de-radicalized class at the level of the national state, right? That very same mechanism, once it actually penetrates down to the state level as part of the process of deepening democracy and then down to the panchayat level, right? Uh, essentially, farmers groups are now political competitors with each other, right? At the panchayat level, even though panchayats are not always organized around party lines, right? So one of the mechanisms which they were present in pointing out is that that politicization, right, that the state produces can also create the condition of a certain kind of atomization of political mobilization. Now, in their story, that atomization was a little bit of a good thing at the level of the national state because it kind of de-radicalized. It was the state's bulwark against revolution, right? But you could argue that the very same mechanism, right, also in a sense undercuts the conditions under which you have different kinds of, you know, if one were to put it crudely, the, the, the real dilemma in Indian mobilization is not class versus caste. Is it, is, it is whether we are fundamentally political creatures, right, political creatures understood as creatures who mobilize around capturing state political power right? Or whether we are fundamentally class-based creatures, where you think that structural location in a class identity, right, also translates automatically into a political identity of some kind. And I think they were very prescient in observing the fact that actually, you know, the contrast they draw is, how do the people assert their sovereignty? Do they do it as voters? Do they do it as, consu you know, consumers, right? Consumers meaning demand groups. And they argued in the book that the beauty of Indian democracy was that we do it as voters. But if we do it as voters, then the mechanism for mobilization that will be more important than class even, right, is not just caste, but it will be the need to build very contingent coalitions around the capture of power. And one implication of that is going to be to fracture and fissure all class-based, you know, occupation-based movements, right? Uh, labor movement split, agrarian movement split, right? So I think, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of sort of speculating, but I think it is worth thinking about whether the simultaneous, in a sense, and, and again, just to sort of just extend this argument for a minute, even now, even today, 
just think of this interesting fact, which I think the rurals would have predicted quite presently. When we think of sources of political resistance to ultra-nationalist, centralized politics, right? Our first instinct is not that the source of resistance is actually going to come from the Congress party or from another centrist liberal party. Our first instinct is to think it must be some coalition of regional leaders, right? Who are, you know, who mobilize, you know, that there are enough remnants of that old caste-based politics mobilizational form remain, which will not, as it were, be easily appropriated in this logic of ultra-nationalist mobilization and ultra-centralizing mobilization, right? So we want Mulayan to win, or we, many people want Mulayan to win for that reason. You want Mamrata to win for that reason. Because you think that the prospects of India remaining a democracy, or at least a deep democracy, actually paradoxically hinge on these characters and these parties that in and of themselves do not correspond to any canons of democratic mobilization. But they perform the same function against its absolute centralization, right? That Todd's intermediate orders did against the monarchy, right? I mean, so when you are in a kind of, you know, when you actually have a monarch, right, asserting sovereignty, you better have a lot of aristocratic intermediate orders. Those will be much more effective bulwarks, right? Then actually trying to construct a first principles based, you know, atomized individual rights based politics against this, right? And I think this is what makes Indian democracy is a little bit sort of precarious at this point because we aren't sure which way this is going to go, right? Uh, you can just spin out two scenarios. Let's say the BJP wins the UP election, right? Uh, it'll be unprecedented. I mean, it'll be absolutely unprecedented achievement uh, if they do. It will consolidate a political configuration that is unprecedented in India. It has become the natural ruling party now of India, actually, BJP. I mean, if you, if you look at its presence in different states, I mean, it's the party to beat rather than Congress, right? Right? Uh, and remember, Congress was also composed of those intermediate orders. You know, the very thing that made Congress less radical socially and less revolutionary in economic terms, right, was also the very thing that kind of prevented Congress from sort of centralizing, right? Uh, we used to talk about centralization of Congress party under Indira Gandhi. Honest truth is, in retrospect, uh, Indira Gandhi centralization was com nothing compared to what we have right now. I mean, now it's a very weak party. Uh, in Indira Gandhi's time, you could still point to five or six regional leaders who, if they walked out of the Congress party, took a sizable chunk of the vote with them, right? She still had to rely on that, right? Chief ministers in the South. There's, I mean, there's just nothing left there, right? So to kind of conclude, I mean, I think what the Rudolphs were doing, or I mean, or at least this gloss on the work of Rudolphs, they were pointing to this I think neglected tradition in social theory. I think I think Tocqueville was the best exemplar of that, which actually took seriously the idea that a discourse of a politics based around the atomized individual voter, that's the you know canonical liberal subject, right? Uh, while that may be a normatively desirable goal in terms of thinking about what freedom and equality mean for the individual, in sociological terms, it can also create the conditions of actually producing a kind of democratic absolutism, right? Um, and which is why, I mean, I think as, as just a matter of philosophical anthropology, the Rudolphs always their critique of liberal theory, their critique of, not liberal ideals by the way, I mean kind of liberal social theory, was that it was a bit naive to think that, you know, people will sort of give up their identities, that differences would simply become a matter of personal or dietary preferences. I mean, I think there's a deep philosophical anthropology about the human need to articulate kind of communities and so forth. But I think there was this more interesting, politically interesting concern about what actually makes for 
stable um, democracies in which power is actually dispersed. One last point, and I'll just kind of close with that on this thing, which again, you know, re-looking at the, as the book Modernity of Tradition, and particularly the, the essay on Gandhi, um, I want to link it to the demonetization debate in a you know, you might say, what's the connection, right? This is a book. You have to talk about demonetization if you're talking about this kind of kind of thing. So the way I went to link it is the following. And again, a hypothesis we constructed out of their thinking. I'm not sure they would have put it in this way. They'll probably be aghast uh, that this was being used this way. But, uh, uh, but you know, that's what you do with social theory. You use it, right? As opposed to careful historical research, which is what it is. So this interesting question, why is there not much protest around demonetization, right? Now you can run two hypotheses on this. One, which is the current conventional one. Well, you know, Mr. Modi has promised something. There's a social contract at the end of this. People are waiting to see what gets delivered. They'll see if black money actually comes out, if corruption actually goes down. We will see how bad the economic downturn is. And then somehow the protest will begin, right? So it's perfectly understandable that there's no protest. And you know, it is an astonishing civic moment at one level, right? Millions of people standing in queues, you know, taking hits to livelihood, right? I think the Rudolphs were all on to something quite interesting about India, which has again been less remarked on. It goes back to this question of caste versus class mobilization, right? So when they talked about caste politics in India, uh, the two kind of attributes of caste politics that are interesting. One, it's an easier access of social mobilization than caste class politics has been traditionally. But second, if you actually look at the history of political violence in India, right? Uh, I think this, this very stylized feature stands out. I mean, recent political violence, you know, post kind of independence, right? Very stylized factor, which is, so either you can have a form of political violence that actually depends on organizations and political parties, right? So Naxalism at one end of the spectrum. But by definition, almost all political violence needs a form of political articulation. Some political party has to instigate it. In fact, the fact that there's no violence associated with demonetization, to my mind, only proves the thesis that you actually need political parties to instigate violence. Uh, otherwise, you don't get, right? But, but, more seriously, more seriously, uh, it's easier to generate political violence around community identity. Historically, it's always been the case. So, you know, the question was asked, well, the Jats burnt Haryana just two years ago, right? Why is there nothing happening now, right? For, I think, an interesting insight, I think, they had in terms of, you know, India's reception of Gandhi in some ways and, you know, the, the, the modernity of a kind of saintly culture, which is when you undertake mobilization on behalf of a community, right, whatever the construction of that community, religious community, communal identity, caste, whatever, there is a larger moral economy in which that violence is at least morally sublimated, right? you're not alone, there's a we that has morally, in a sense, approved it. You are part of constructing a community that is going to persist through time on behalf of which this violence, in a sense, being undertaken. And as many theorists have pointed out, I mean, the, the, the reason, in a sense, communalization or communities unleash violence is they can abstract the individual from their individuality and make them larger part of a part of, uh, part of a larger whole. It's a form of self-alienation that allows you, right, to in a sense live with the fact of violence, right? I mean, there's an oversimplification. No matter how bad structural oppression is, right, and even if you recognize the fact that you are structurally oppressed in economic terms, there is still a touch of the moral idea that violence undertaken for economic reasons, right? Violence in the sense of kind of directed, self-conscious political violence taken for, is still a form of self-interested violence, 
I'm doing something that will serve my interest. I'm not doing something where I'm actually abstracting from my interest and doing it for the larger good, right? From the outside community, violence seems to be like they're doing it in their self-interest, right? But in terms of the individual's relationship to that act of violence, right? right? And I think one of the interesting things Rudolph's kind of toyed in, you know, in this kind of discussion of saintliness in the Indian tradition, the kind of receptivity, you know, of, 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 of Gandhi in a different way, right? is whether the, the hold of that moral economy, right, uh, which basically says that in order, f one of the conditions for violence to be made morally acceptable is that it needs that kind of narrative of self-alienation. And one of the challenges is that economics never quite provides it, right? So, you know, unless you actually have somebody going out and really, really organizing, and there is no organized force left for a variety of reasons, right? You would rather choose that narrative of self-alienation that gives you a larger meaning, right? Um, you know, to use Svetlana Alexevich's phrase, um, you know, one of the reasons you have a crisis of meaning in contemporary liberal democracies is because our economic policy makers promised you all a mall. Some of you got a mall, some of you didn't, but what you actually wanted was a motherland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <And there. laughs>